Will Raby is going to give us a presentation from Equip for Equality. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Uh, yeah, so my colleague Melanie and I are here to talk a bit about children's special education rights, both uh, now during COVID-19 school closures and remote learning, and then how that will impact um, students' rights when they return to school. And so I'm going to be talking through the presentation, and Melanie will be monitoring the chat and trying to answer questions. We want to have as many people participate as possible. We found that um, you know, one big benefit to doing these presentations is hearing from parents, um, from educators, from administrators, people who are involved in seeing how this is playing out in different schools and different districts. So um, please do feel comfortable to participate either by jumping in the chat or if we have time to have a more open discussion at the end. Um, you know, I think that would be really helpful for everybody. Yeah, and um, Jennifer just linked to the specific slides in the chat and there I linked a couple of times to our more general COVID and special education where we have we're going to go over some tracking forms and some other resources so those are all linked in the chat right now so you can go um, check those out either now or after um, you know we have a link to the like previous presentation recordings already posted on our website in Spanish English and Mandarin um, so you can um, get to those. And we have some poll questions, but we're using a different format with Raise Your Hand today. So I don't think we're gonna be answering those poll questions specifically. Um, and we're gonna keep our conversation to the chat in this um, Zoom meeting function. So um, if you do wanna ask a question that's anonymous, I, uh, or if you wanna just direct it directly to me, Melanie Grant, that would be better if you don't wanna direct it to the whole group. And if you do have a, like an individual question about your child specifically, um, you know, our, our information for our helpline is at the la on the last slide. And so you can take down our number and you can call us, you know, after this meeting and talk with an attorney directly. Great. Um, so as we get started, the first thing we want to do is just remind everybody that first and foremost, you should be taking care of yourself and your family during this time. Uh, you know, things are moving quickly. There's a lot of change happening and school is not the only aspect of your life that may be causing issues. But when it comes to school, remember that you are not a teacher and the school cannot expect you to know how to be a teacher. Um, the most important thing you should be focused on is taking care of yourself and your family. Now, education plays a role in that, but I'm sure a job does, uh, other family members who need your assistance, other responsibilities, personal issues. So education is just one aspect and we're all working to figure out these issues as best we can. Um, but you know issues are going to arise and we'll work through that together and as a reminder if equip for equality is here to help you raise your hand of course it is as well um, but if you have specific questions regarding yourself your student um, you need legal assistance you can always call us directly and we could provide you some more um, individual advice So we're gonna be just touching on some basics of special education law and some terms today. These might be simple review for many of you, but just to make sure we're all working uh, from the same information. So the federal law, that uh, federal special education law is the uh, IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And what IDEA says is that all students are entitled to FAPE, which stands for Free Appropriate Public Education. Now, what FAPE means for each student might vary a little bit, but basically what it means is that all students need to learn or get some benefit from school. Now, that doesn't mean that students are entitled to what's best for them, but only that school should be making sure that the curriculum helps students advance uh, educationally, socially, emotionally, the way it does for all students. Um, and so some students need specialized instruction, therapies, services to help them advance at the same um, or as appropriately as students without disabilities. The way that you get FAPE or get these services to allow your student to receive FAPE is through an IEP, an Individualized Education Program. 
And for those of you who have students with IEPs, uh, or if you're special ed teachers or administrators, I'm sure you're familiar with that, but that's just a document that describes what the student needs in order to be able to access their education. That can mean specialized instruction, it can mean tutoring, paraprofessional support. Um, one area that we're gonna be discussing today is related services. And those are services that um, a student needs to benefit from education. And it can be a variety of things. One example would be occupational therapy supports. Um, so a student who has difficulty with fine motor skills might need occupational therapy services to help them grip a pencil or to work on their handwriting. And so these related services are part of an IEP and are part of FAPE. So as we'll discuss, those still apply and students should be getting them during remote learning. And then finally, compensatory education is extra helper services that you might be able to get to make up for missed services or because your child regressed or had a setback on their IEP goals. So compensatory education is a way when um, a student isn't able to get FAPE, isn't able to access their education, for us to later go back and try to get the school to make up for it by providing extra services or support. So that was a little baseline on special education law and students' rights always, but how are those rights affected or impacted by COVID-19 and remote learning? Well, we're still working to figure out everything, but what we do know is that the U.S. Department of Education has said that if schools are giving educational services to gen ed students, they must give special education services, that is, to follow your child's IEP as much as possible, even during remote learning. So while services might not look exactly the same as they usually do in school, um, you still are entitled to those services and the school should be doing their best job to follow the IEP. Now, like my example of occupational therapy and helping a student with their handwriting, that might be a little difficult during remote learning. Uh, an occupational therapist can't reach through a computer screen and help your student with hand over hand instruction, but they should be finding ways to provide that service just in a different manner. So how can they work with your student to improve their handwriting during remote learning? And then uh, in the state of Illinois, all schools were ordered to move to remote learning on March 31st, 2020. So um, we'll talk about it a bit more, more later, but uh, for the most part, starting April 1st is when students should have been getting these remote learning services. Uh, and uh, there's a picture of Kermit the Frog. We wanna remind you that sitting on the couch watching television is not remote learning. Um, we want the student to be actively engaged as best as possible with the material. Um, so those were a couple polls, as Melanie said, we're uh, not doing them today, but those are, were just us trying to get a feel for how many parents and students have received remote learning plans and are getting their related services. Uh, you know, if you have a specific experience that you want to share, feel free to jump in the chat, but just based on our prior webinars, we've been seeing, you know, it, it depends on school, it depends on district, but the majority of parents have not received a remote learning plan in writing. Some have. Um, if you have, that's great. We'll talk a bit more about what a good remote learning plan looks like. Uh, just because you have one doesn't necessarily mean that we're satisfied with that. And then in terms of related services, we've seen um, some variation. I think speech therapy services have been a little uh, on the higher end, but a lot of families aren't, haven't been getting those related services support. So we'll talk about what you should do if you're having those issues. Um, but first, what services should my child get? Well, first and foremost, we wanna be focused on the IEP, right? That's the document that sort of drives what services the student needs to get um, an appropriate education. So we wanna be focused on working on IEP goals and figuring out how we can do that during um, remote learning. And then on top of that, certain services that are in the IEP, your child should be getting those during remote learning. So um, if they have help from an aid, they should be getting that. And again, it's not gonna look the same. Obviously an aid won't be sitting next to your child 
um, as they complete remote learning, but maybe you can set up time for the student to work with the aide um, or another way for them to be more, more involved with helping your child with instruction. Modifications or accommodations, such as more time on tests, if the student is taking tests in remote learning, those should be applied just as they would be in the school setting. Um, and then related services, as I mentioned, therapies such as speech, physical therapy, occupational therapy, the students should be getting those minutes. Um, it might not look exactly like it does in school or be to the same extent, but the school needs to be trying their best as possible to implement those services as they are in the IEP. Uh, and then social work counseling services, same thing. Um, we want to find, you know, productive ways that we can still be implementing these services, meeting with a social worker over Zoom or on the phone, um, but to still have that interaction in those times. And then assistive technology, this is um, an important one. If a student has a computer or a specific learning program in school, they should be getting that during remote learning. And on top of that, if the school is providing remote learning that requires technology, you should be discussing with them to make sure you have access to that technology so that your student can participate in remote learning. It doesn't do any good to say we're going to, you know, have Zoom video sessions if you don't have access to a device that allows you to participate in those calls. All right, so Will, we got a question um, that said, should therapies be one on one with a student or in a full classroom? And I think you, you touched on that a little bit saying, you know, it's not gonna look exactly the same. I think it really depends on what the IEP goals are and what the service is. I think I saw, you know, someone remark on Twitter who's normally in this group, I think um, that her child finally was able to meet with the social worker for even 15 minutes and it really like changed the outlook for him for that day and was able to, you know, move forward with remote learning. Um, so it might not be, you know, the full, you know, if you have 30 minutes per week, it might be a shorter periods of time. It might be a one-on-one -on -one check in It might be a small group. Um, I don't think the full classroom is really what the spirit of the IEP is. Um, I think that's, that would be difficult to manage um, a speech therapy goal or something more specific like that with a whole classroom. It might depend on um, your child's classroom. You know, I, I don't know every situation, but I mean, I think if there's 13 kids um, in that, that might be a little bit difficult to really focus. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about tracking what's going on and so that you can you know, present your case of why your student should be getting these compensatory education services that we mentioned in the beginning. So, I mean, there's no mandate, there's no requirement that says it needs to look like this. Um, I think you should be talking with the service providers and trying to figure out, okay, what makes sense and, um, you know, how can we see that my child is really going to be able to focus on their goals, participate in remote learning, um, make some progress during this time, and it, it might not be the same for everyone and it might not be the same um, as it was what we would expect in school because we're not we're not in that same environment so there's no hard and fast like yes or no to this question yeah definitely um you know we'll talk about comp ed a little bit and melanie mentioned this but basically what we're doing is trying to figure out what can we get now that's best for the student to help make sure they're still getting an education now and then even if that's not everything they need we'll try to get extra services to make up for what they missed out on yeah, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to hit the raise your hand button or unmute themselves um, and we could take a, a minute for a couple of questions or you can just enter into the chat and we'll just take breaks like this throughout to answer some questions. Um, so this is an example of a remote learning plan. This is one that we saw from a client uh, of ours that we uh, did not think was very good. And this is when I mentioned, um, we want students to have remote learning plans because we want parents to be working with the schools to figure out how their students will be getting services during remote learning. Um, but we also wanna make sure that 
it's a good remote learning plan because not just anything will do. Uh, this example simply lists that the student would get academic instruction either via Zoom or phone uh, for math and writing. And it says that for estimated minutes, times may vary per month. And that's not particularly helpful because it doesn't give us a baseline of what as a parent or a student you should expect from the school. And it doesn't help us determine whether or not what they're getting is appropriate. So one thing that we would recommend is uh, ask for a specific amount of minutes. So for example, instead of saying, you know, times may vary per month, you could say 60 minutes of math instruction per week. And maybe 60 minutes is enough, maybe it isn't, but at least then we can track and say, okay, are they getting the 60 minutes? If not, we have to talk with the school about figuring out how they can actually implement the remote learning plan. And if they are getting 60 minutes, but they aren't making appropriate progress, or you don't think it's enough instruction for them uh, to meet their IEP goals, then we can go back to the school and we have a baseline to go off of and say, okay, we know 60 minutes isn't enough, um, you know, can we increase that maybe to 90 minutes per week? The other thing we would recommend is to ask for a schedule. So instead of just saying they'll get this amount of minutes per month or this amount of minutes per week, let's break it out into an actual schedule. So if it's 60 minutes per week, will that be 30 minutes two days a week? Will that be 15 minutes four days a week? And having that sort of concrete uh, schedule and learning plan will help you as a parent track whether the student is getting those services from the school. And if they're not, we can address that issue. If they are getting it, but it's not good enough, then we can address that issue as well. But it gives you something to go off of. Uh, this learning plan, you know, a month might go by and you will have no idea whether the student is getting what they're supposed to, whether they're supposed to be getting more, whether you need to ask the school to offer them more. So as much as possible, we want to break things down into really concrete terms, you know, a number of minutes, um, a specific schedule, things like that. So next, we're going to go into some hypotheticals. And, you know, remote learning has been tough. We said it's varying a lot how it's being implemented uh, across districts, even across schools. Even within some schools, we've seen inconsistencies with how this stuff is um, playing out. So these are just some hypotheticals to give an idea of issues that we are seeing. Um, if parents who are joining us today have specific concerns or questions that they want to bring up, we'd be happy to talk about those as well. Um, but so we're just going to give some examples. So the first one is Tyel. Tyel's a third grader with autism in separate special education classes for core academic classes. So far in remote learning, the teacher has sent tip sheets and things to do, but um, as a parent, Tyel's parent <laughs> feels like they have to act as the teacher. Um, Tyel has not been getting speech, OT, or social work. There is no formal remote learning plan beyond tip sheets and the activities. Um, and, you know, like we said, uh, not getting related services, even though we should be. And there's a behaviors call into Google Meet two times per week for 30 minutes to play games as a class, but there isn't any uh, instruction going on. It's just worksheets. Um, what can I do and what should I get? Well, first of all, you should contact the school to set up a meeting to develop a formal remote learning plan. It, it, I might kind of sound like I'm repeating myself with this, but really that is the place that we want to start so that we have a baseline of what we can expect um, the school to be getting and we have something that we can say, look, you know, this is what you agreed to provide and you're not providing it. Um, in that remote learning plan, I would push to get, um, you know, specific details on how they plan to deliver the related services, speech, OT, social work. How uh, is Tyel going to get that during remote learning? Beyond that, um, you know, Tyel's in separate special education classes, so he should be getting specialized instruction for those core academic classes. So, um, you know, are we going to have times to meet with the special ed teacher either as a group or one on one um, 
to make sure that he's able to complete his assignments and keep making progress in the academic classes. And then, you know, I, I would also just try to communicate with the school that you feel like a lot of it is falling on you as a parent to be a teacher and that you aren't, you know, you're not trained in how to do this. You don't know how to teach students with autism. You don't know how um, these special education services are supposed to be provided. So they need to be helping you and it should not be you trying to figure out how to implement the school's plan. It should be the school figuring out how to implement a remote learning plan. So those are just some ideas. Um, Melanie, I don't know if you have any more input on that situation or uh, if there are any questions that have been brought up about this or other situations. Yeah, Bridget asked pretty much the same question right before we went to Tyel's example of you know, they're just doing web based learning. They're not getting any instruction from a teacher and Margarita's also saying, well, what about 15 minutes per week with the teacher? Is that, you know, with a general education teacher, is that enough? And, you know, I don't, I don't know your situation. I don't know, um, you know, what grade or anything like that is. I mean, 15 minutes per week sounds pretty slim to me as, um, that anything productive or any instruction can be provided during that time. So, you know, again, I think it should be, um, it sh you should be sending emails to the school, the case manager, to the principal saying, look, like we want a remote learning plan. We, we understand it's not gonna be six to seven hours of school per day with the teachers running it, um, but we want something that is meaningful and we want a schedule and we want to know we want some instruction and you know I think to keep pushing against the school and say um, I'm sorry I'm not okay sorry I just saw a question I was trying to read it um, but you know we might not be successful. You, you might have all of these emails and you might not be successful in getting more services, more, more time. Um, I think we've kind of fallen into a remote learning kind of, you know, status at this point, you know, people are working from home and they've gotten used to it. So I think maybe things are evening out a little bit more than in the beginning. So I think maybe it's a good time to say, well, let's schedule something specific. Like every Tuesday and Thursday, we're gonna do 45 minutes on English or on ELA skills and, you know, we're going to go through something and, you know, is 45 minutes twice a week enough? You know, probably not. But, um, you know, I think try and push for whatever you can get and, you know, don't just take what they say and say, okay, I guess that's all I get. I would keep, you know, pushing and saying, well, what else can we do? And this, you know, like, how are we going to, address the grade level content, how are we going to push the student to be able to make progress. So, I mean, I think, you know, whatever you think makes sense, like someone's just asking now, can we ask for teacher to parent consultation? Absolutely. I think that's really key and say, okay, well, if I'm going to be running um, these different things at home, like, let me have a 30 minute conversation with the teacher on Mondays, so that we can have a good week throughout the week and we can work on these assignments. I think that is absolutely appropriate. So, I mean, whatever you think would help you help your child make progress during this time, be asking for that and be asking for it in writing. Absolutely. And, you know, asking for these things in writing will help you create a record. And we'll talk a bit more about that uh, a little later in the presentation. But that can be helpful not only for getting services now, but if you do need to try to get compensatory services later, having a record that shows that you are communicating with the school about um, the remote learning plan being uh, insufficient or inaccessible to your child will be really helpful at that time. Um, we, have another, so we have another question just really quick about whether or not um, they're supposed to be introducing new content and in, during remote learning. And I think, yes, they should be introducing new content. We are, this is a school day. Uh, they're counting as school days. And, you know, I know there's some relaxed requirements for grading and for promotion and things like that at this time, but students should be introduced um, to what they, what they need to make progress. Um, and so if they're in third grade, they should be going through third grade material. Um,
so anyway, I think uh, um, I'll turn it back over to Will and maybe I'll answer some of these questions in the chat. Sure. Um, so our next hypothetical is about a uh, sixth grader with a specific learning disability with a multi-sensory reading program. Uh, the parent doesn't think that the outline schedule is going to be enough to meet her learning needs or to follow the Wilson reading program and what can they do? For those of you who aren't familiar with um, Wilson reading, it's just a reading program for students uh, with specific learning disabilities to help them read. It's just a specific methodology uh, for teaching reading. Uh, so looking at Isabel's schedule, she has reading 9 to 9.30, Monday through Thursday, then 9.30 to 10, she has math. Um, then the next 30 minutes are either science or social studies, depending on the day, and then one-to-one -one schedule. So first, I just want to point out the, the good things with this. Uh, this is a very concrete schedule, right? We know what services Isabel is supposed to be receiving, and we know when she's supposed to be getting them. So that provides you a great baseline as a parent to be able to track whether or not she's getting her services. You know that, um, you know, 9 to 9.30, she should be getting reading with, you know, Miss whoever the reading teacher is. Uh, and if she's not, then that's a problem. Or if she is and it's not enough, then that's a problem. And I think that's sort of what the parent's concern here is, is, you know, what if I don't think this is going to be enough? Well, I would let the school know that you think that it's not enough. Um, if you specifically have concerns about the Wilson Reading Program, I would try to talk with them about figuring out how they can make sure that they're providing the type of instruction that she gets in school with um, you know, the Wilson Certified Teacher. So whether that's increasing her one-on-one -on -one minutes with the Wilson Reading Instructor or finding um, other activities or videos that she can be doing to supplement the time that she does have one-on-one uh, -on -one with the reading teacher could be helpful. And I, you know, I think just tracking how it's working, right? If you go back to the school and say, this isn't good enough, maybe they'll say, okay, here's more minutes, but maybe they won't. Maybe they'll say, well, we think this is, you know, sufficient. And so what we want you to be doing on your end is tracking how she's doing. Um, is she making progress? Is she moving towards those IEP goals? And if she's not, then that gives you uh, more of an argument to go back to the school and say, look, here's what I'm tracking and I can show you this isn't enough and she needs more time. So I would be tracking it. I would be pushing the school to find creative ways to meet uh, her needs. Like we said, maybe the Wilson reading instructor doesn't have time to meet with her for as long as you would like every day or every week, but finding ways to incorporate additional services or if they can do some group work, um, but just to be in communication with the school about what you think she needs and then tracking how it's going as those services are being provided. And then uh, this is our last example. This is a student in Juan, a 10th grade student with emotional disability and often defiant and aggressive behaviors. Juan has short check-ins with the social worker twice a week. Uh, other than that, he has to log into Google Classroom by himself to get work and turn in homework. He doesn't want to do the remote classes or his remote work. What can I do? What should I ask for from the school? This is one that we're seeing a lot, unfortunately. Uh, students don't want to do remote learning. And it's hard because as a parent, you shouldn't have to sit there and make sure Juan is logging into Google Classroom and downloading his assignments and completing them and uploading them. But often we're seeing that fall on the parents. So again, we want to contact the school and figure out some remote learning plan to, to help Juan access that education. And that could be you know, more consistent check-ins with the social worker if those seem like they're helping. Um, it could be check-ins with his teacher, uh, paraprofessional, as we mentioned, if Juan has a paraprofessional in the IEP, then we want to be trying to figure out how that aid can be providing direct support to Juan uh, you know, as he's doing his remote learning. We don't want situations where a one-on-one -on -one aid is just sitting in on a 
you know, group remote learning session and counting that as Juan's minutes. Juan should be getting some direct instruction from that aid and some direct support. Uh, and then also working with the school to figure out how you can change the learning program to help motivate Juan, right? It's, it's a difficult question for different students. They'll be motivated differently, but maybe, you know, there's a reward when he does his assignments. Maybe if he completes a couple assignments, he can skip one. Um, you know, just finding a way to make it more accessible and to help motivate Juan without you needing to be involved. Because if there's a day where you can help and you can make sure he does his work, that's great. But there are probably going to be a lot of days where you can't. And so we don't want to set that as the expectation um, that, you know, you, as a parent, you will be kind of keeping an eye and making sure Juan does his work. And on those days when he can't do his work, I would, you know, keep track of that and notify the school and say, hey, you know, Juan, you know, refused to sign on today. Um, he couldn't get his work done. I wasn't able to help him because I was working from home or because I have another student who needed my assistance. So keeping track of that, notifying the school when the student isn't able to access the work, but then also working with them to figure out how can we adjust his remote learning plan to make it something that's accessible for him. The school should be working with you to meet the needs of the student. It's not good enough to just say, well, this is what we're offering and then sort of say, it's up to the student to figure it out. Yeah, so there's a little bit of discussion in the chat going about um, whether or not new content should be introduced during remote learning. And um, so Mo was able to quote from Isby saying that it's a recommendation that no new content should be introduced because of, you know, students' ability to access the, the remote learning or whether, you know, they have a parent at home that can help them or they have technology access or different special education needs and things like that. Um, as a recommendation from ISB, um, you know, I think what the, the guidance has, has um, been issued and, and I think there's been a lot of changes and updates um, that might still be the recommendation. Um, but since, you know, I don't know if remote learning is going to be ending in the fall when school starts again. So I think, you know, we should be using the IEP as a guide for what we would want our students to be learning and, and working on. Um, and I think, you know, we don't want them to fail. We want them to have the supports they need. I, I think um, it's pretty clear that remote learning is not a good, um, a, you know, we're not replicating the school day. It's not gonna be what we would hope for in the school, um, a good substitute for that. I, I think we wanna focus on as much as we can, what students can access and how we can work together with um, teachers to um, help them work on those IEP goals and, and make progress, whatever that might be for your child. And, um, you know, I, I, we're gonna get into next, you know, what to do if you don't think it's sufficient. So, I mean, I think maybe that's a good transition point where maybe you're not getting new content and, or maybe you don't want new contact, it's too, too much for your child. And so there's different things that you can do to address that with the school, at, um, you know, once we have an idea of how long remote learning is going to last, um, some things that you can do to make requests of the school. Um, okay, yeah, definitely. And the guidance, it's helpful, but it's all sort of coming out as we're figuring things out and it's delayed. So, you know, as much as possible, we would encourage you just to work directly with your school and figure out how you can meet the needs of your student. Um, if there are things in the guidance that you find it helpful or beneficial to you, then go ahead and use that to your advantage. But um, I wouldn't feel the need to limit what you're asking for based off of what is be recommended, especially because those recommendations are changing as, um, remote learning gets extended. And, you know, if it's extended into the fall, we'll probably see a whole new um, slew of recommendations. So uh, just something to keep in mind. This is a note that you should not waive any rights. Uh, initially, we were seeing some schools and districts asking parents to sign a form 
waiving or giving away rights either to services now or to the right to compensatory education services later. Uh, ISB has since issued guidance, this is guidance we like, that says school districts should not be doing this. So hopefully um, schools aren't doing this anymore. If you have received a waiver like this, um, please contact our special education helpline and we can take a look at whatever you signed and give you some advice on if you need to be um, doing anything with the school to uh, change that. But hopefully we're not seeing these anymore, but you should not be asked to waive any rights through remote learning. So Chris um, just asked a question saying, would signing a remote learning plan be a waiver to prevent a parent from requesting compensatory education services um, in the future? And you know, this is something we're gonna talk about and we talked about it a little bit with the Isabel example, like you could have a remote learning plan and you could still think it's not enough. And so, um, you know, you could say, okay, we'll take these services because we want some services during remote learning, but we're not agreeing that this offers a FAPE and this is all that my child needs to be uh, making appropriate progress. Yeah, exactly. And that is actually what this example is, one of the ones we saw was um, saying that if a parent declined to the services that were being offered, they could not get compensatory education. And so sort of a similar idea, right? They're saying, we'll give you this, and if you take it, you can't complain about it later. Um, or if you don't take it, you can't complain that you didn't get the services. They shouldn't be doing either of those. Um, a remote learning plan is not to replace an IEP. It is to describe how the school will deliver the IEP during remote learning. So we're maintaining, you know, as a parent, you can take a remote learning plan and at the same time send something to the school saying, look, I still don't think this is enough, but, you know, I'm willing to try it or I think this is about, you know, I understand you're saying this is what you can give me right now. And then we'll continue to track if the remote learning plan doesn't meet, you know, what's in the IEP and try to get comp services for that later. So Juan had asked, they asked if we wanted to waive our right to a remote learning IEP. I'm not sure what a remote learning IEP is. Like, were mm -hmm. you having an IEP meeting? Um, I don't know if maybe Juan, you wanna unmute yourself and explain a little bit more. Um, and then others are asking, are saying the same thing, like, you know, will the remote, will CPS say the remote learning plan was a way of delivery of services? And I think that's what we're saying. Like, you can accept a remote learning plan as, okay, we're going to go for it with this plan, but not accept the fact that they, um, that plan is a, a FAPE, a free appropriate public education for your child. So, um, it doesn't cut off your ability to ask for compensatory education services in the future if you do accept a remote learning plan. Mm -hmm. And it, it's confusing. Um, remote learning plans, IEPs, they want to talk about making remote learning plans at IEP meetings. They want to schedule remote learning plan meetings, RLP, IEP. It, it is very confusing. Um, I would recommend that, and, and or I would insist that don't make any changes to your student's IEP based on the remote learning plan. So the IEP should stay the same. That describes the students, the student, the services the student needs for FAPE to make appropriate progress. The remote learning plan is just a separate document that's going to describe how we're getting those services during remote learning. So as much as possible, we want to make sure that we're keeping the IEP intact. We're not changing it. We're not removing services. We're not changing what services they're supposed to be getting. We're just saying, okay, we're gonna create this separate plan that's gonna talk about how we'll provide the IEP while we're in remote learning. And then uh, for whatever you know, shortcomings there are, or if you're not getting all the services that you're supposed to get during remote learning, you can pursue compensatory education. What is compensatory education? It's extra educational services to make up for past missed services or past inappropriate services. So these are services that are designed to put the student in the place that he or she would have been in if the student had received a FAPE. 
So if the school either isn't providing the services a student's supposed to get, or they're not agreeing to provide the services a student needs, um, for example, just related services, right? If a student has speech therapy in their IEP and they're not getting speech minutes right now, they're not meeting with the speech path, um, they're supposed to have one-on-one -on -one every week and they haven't been doing that, or maybe the school just recently started doing it, but they weren't for the last like month and a half, well, you should be able to get compensatory education to make up for those services that you missed. Um, in Illinois, it's a more holistic, individualized approach. So it's not as simple as saying my student missed 60 minutes of speech, so they get 60 minutes of speech in the future. Um, compensatory education services are designed to, like I said, put the student in the place that he or she would have been in if they received a FAPE. So, a student who misses 60 minutes of speech services might need more speech services to make up for that. They might need less because they might get, you know, more intense one-on-one -on -one services than they normally do. Um, it can vary, but you do have a right to get those services. And because of that, it's important to keep a good record uh, if you want to try to get those services so you can show, you know, just because a student misses 60 minutes of speech doesn't mean you'll get 60 minutes but it really helps you make your argument for that fact that they do need extra services and can kind of create a baseline of, okay, well, this is what they missed out on. How do we make up for it? Yeah, so Will, do you wanna just kind of go over again, the remote learning plan and the like ability to request compensatory education services? Cause I think there's some confusion of whether um, if you have a remote learning plan, then that, that will preclude you from getting those compensatory education services. You wanna just go over that one more time? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're starting with the IEP, right? That's always our baseline. The IEP is the document that describes what services your student needs to make appropriate progress. Anytime a student doesn't get the services in their IEP, that's a denial of faith. So if a student isn't getting those IEP services, you're entitled to compensatory education to make up for those missed services. Now, the way the remote learning plan comes in is because during remote learning, a lot of times an IEP might not be able to be provided or delivered in the same manner as it is in school. Um, services might look different. What they're doing within those services might vary. So a remote learning plan is basically a way to say, okay, we know that we're supposed to be getting what's in the IEP, but the IEP is designed to describe how a student can get those services in school. We're not in school, so we're gonna create a remote learning plan, which will describe how the student should get those services outside of school. Now, a remote learning plan in an ideal world will provide your student with everything that they're entitled to in the IEP but that, that might not always be possible. There might be issues with the student accessing the services. The school might say they're not able to provide the services. So anything, anytime that you have a remote learning plan, but it doesn't get you to FAPE, you're still falling short of the services in the IEP. You're still, you can get comp ed to make up for that. And what we're stressing is working with the school to cre create a remote learning plan that will do the best that they can, but all the, but at that time you should maintain that you have the right to pursue comp ed to make up for it. So look, it shouldn't be an all or nothing, right? As a parent, you shouldn't be required to say, okay, I'll take these services and have no way to make up for it if those services don't end up providing faith. So a remote learning plan should not replace an IEP it should not prevent you from pursuing compensatory education. All it is, is you working with the school to figure out how they can try to give them, the student these services during remote learning. And if there is a, a shortcoming, if the remote learning plan does not reach the services that are described in the IEP, then you can still pursue compensatory education to make up for those missed services later. Yeah, so well, it looks like there's a lot of discussion on that um, the remote learning plan is just not sufficient and, you know, just this thought process that CPS is going to say, well, we did this remote learning plan, we, you got that. Um, mm. You know, I think 
Um, I think that's a valid concern, and I think I think it's true. I don't think what CPS is providing is, is sufficient for mm -hmm. you know general ed students, let alone special education students who need significantly more accommodations, modifications, and instruction and support. I mean, we're mm -hmm. seeing um, you know we just saw I think this morning or yesterday um, some other states where families are filing like class complaints against school districts for inadequate remote learning for special education students. So, I mean, I think that's something that Equip for Equality might be interested in pursuing in the future. And I think what we'd like, we're going to move now into like the tracking component of, um, of like what you can do to like show us what the failures are in a way that we could show, you know, a, a judge or a hearing officer or someone like that. Um, you know, I don't know if we're gonna, you know, do something similar, but it's things that we're hearing from, you know, we've heard from Hawaii, we've heard from Virginia, that, um, you know, the remote learning is not sufficient, especially for special education students. So we hear you, we agree, and we want to put you in the best position that you can be in to, you know, get these services in the future since we're hitting roadblocks in getting them right now. Yeah, and I will just add one last thing on that. Um, so we have uh, pushed CPS and the State Board of Education to provide some more clear guidance and instruction on how they view these remote learning plans. And we are maintaining the position that they don't replace an IEP. They don't set a new baseline for, you know, the services that are appropriate for a student. So some of that still does need to be figured out. I would push back if CPS tries to claim to you um, on an individual level that it does. And again, that's why we're saying don't sign any waivers. Don't um, agree to anything that says um, a remote learning plan is FAPE or that you're waiving comp ed and don't agree to make any changes to the IEP to reflect remote learning. And as long as you do that on your end, you're preserving your rights to comp ed. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep trying to duke it out with the districts and with the State Board of Education to make sure that you have that down the road. Uh, so speaking of compensatory education, we're gonna talk a little bit about tracking important information during remote learning, uh, why it's important and how you can use it to your advantage. First and foremost, write down all communication and keep a record. Uh, you know, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. That's what we always say. That's what many attorneys say because uh, there's no way to show that something happened if it was just words over the phone, people conveniently forget, um, people move on to new jobs, new opportunities. And so you wanna have it in writing so that you can show down the road, you know, this did happen. Um, and I did talk to the school about it. So, you know, send follow-up emails. If you do have phone conversations with the school, if you're on Zoom and things aren't captured in writing, just, you know, do your best to send an email following up saying, you know, thanks for contacting me this morning. We discussed my concerns that, you know, Johnny isn't getting the minutes that he needs or he's not able to access remote learning services and, you know, how we can figure out how to address it just so that you have a record of, you know, the school being on notice that you're having issues um, and that, you know, you're trying to work with them to uh, create a remote learning plan, revise the services. Uh, similarly, let the school know in writing of technology or behavior problems. So, you know, there are a lot of ways that a student might not be able to access remote learning. And these are two big ones, right? Student refuses to log on and do the work on their own or we have a technology problem. Um, you know, we have lots of families that say, my student is using my cell phone to log on to the remote learning. Um, and sometimes I need it for work so they can't use it during those times. Well, you need to be emailing the school and first of all saying the student could not access the services today either because you know, they didn't have access to a computer. Maybe you have a computer, but you have three students, one computer, and they're all supposed to use it at the same time for remote learning, letting them know they weren't able to log on, so they didn't get those services, or you know they refused to do it. I wasn't able to get him to do it. I was busy, so he didn't log on, or he logged on and then he just spaced out. You know, I know he logged in, but then he was uh, playing Fortnite 
for the duration of his class, and so he didn't get those services. Uh, similarly, we want to track time on remote learning uh, when they're working with and without the school or the teacher's help. So, you know, if they aren't accessing it, we want to know. If they are accessing it, we want to know that too, and we want to know what kind of support they were getting because this will help us, you know, going forward, figure out, do they need more minutes? Do they need more direct instruction? Um, all this data will help, you know, support your argument when you go back to the school and say that the remote learning plan is not working if you're having issues. And, you know, the other way you point to the remote learning plan not working, well, we want to track progress or regression. Um, so if the student is meeting their IEP goals, if they're completing their assignments, uh, if they're doing remote exams, how those are going. We want to try to track that as best as possible so that if they do have issues and we pursue comp ed, we can point to the lack of progress or the regression and make that argument for them needing extra services to make up for that. Uh, so next, we have a few different examples of, of sample tracking forms that we created. You can gain access to these uh, either on our website or I'm sure we can send them out. Uh, so we want to be keeping track of a few different things. Uh, this is just a information tracking form for distance yeah, learning. Yeah. So, you know, by day um, for reading, the teacher was doing a 45 minute lesson and then a note that Amanda was focused for 20 minutes during the lesson. So, you know, even though her remote learning plan might say 45 minutes of reading on April 1st, she actually only got 20 minutes of reading. Uh, speech, similarly, um, 10 minutes, Amanda worked independently with the therapist. Okay, great. It looks like she got her speech that day. So um, that's good. And then, you know, if that's enough and the, the 10 minutes of speech is working, then we can keep doing that moving forward. If she, you start to see regression or she's not moving towards her speech goals, then we can go back to the school and say, look, she's been getting 10 minutes um, and that's been, you know, that's been helpful, but really she needs more. She needs 15 minutes, she needs 20 minutes um, because she's not meeting these IEP goals. And then uh, the last one is writing, uh, persons involved mom. So it looks like the school didn't provide any direct instruction for this assignment. And the comment is that mom had to work and was unable to help with Amanda's writing assignment. And that's totally fine. And we expect that to happen. And so as a parent, we just want to make sure that you're keeping track of that because again, it's not your job to be the teacher. And so when your student isn't getting that instruction because you're not a teacher and you have other things going on like work or other children, um, that's not remote learning. Amanda hasn't learned, right? She didn't do the assignment. So we want to keep track of that. Uh, this is a communication log. This is another thing that can be really helpful in just keeping track of uh, your communication. And especially if, you know, sending a follow-up email is always a great idea, but um, maybe not always is realistic if you're in the middle of a busy day. So as best you can, just keep track of okay, uh, on this day, I emailed her teacher because I couldn't access the lesson. On this day, we had an IEP meeting uh, on Zoom because she hasn't been getting PT. Uh, and th that's helpful because it shows that the school has been aware of these issues, right? A lot of times what we see is the school will say, oh, well, we didn't know she wasn't getting PT or we didn't know that this was a problem, you know, let's figure it out. And it's like, well, no, you did know it was a problem because on the first day of remote learning, you know, we had an IEP meeting and we discussed how we were gonna figure this out. So uh, as best as possible, just tracking communication can be really helpful. And then uh, this is our last one. It's a behavior log, which I think can also be helpful uh, for students who have behavioral issues or aren't able to uh, engage always with remote learning. It's just a simple way to track, you know, how engaged was the student? How were their behaviors on that day? Uh, so for example, the week of the 5th to the 10th, on Monday, they had a great day. Uh, they paid attention, they accessed their services. On Tuesday, they uh, were having behavioral concerns all day. They didn't access any schoolwork. 
Wednesday, half the day, Thursday, another great day. And so this is a, a helpful way to just sort of quickly keep track of, you know, how much they're actually engaging with the remote learning plan, how much they're taking part in these services, and hopefully is a little easier than um, trying to break it out by class or by lesson. You know, it's as much as we can stress, I don't want this to feel like, oh my gosh, like Equip for Equality told us that we have to be chasing our children around with a notepad and, you know, my cell phone and typing out an email with one hand while I scribble down notes with my other hand about how remote learning went. That, that's not what we're saying, you know, do your best. Um, if you haven't been tracking any of this stuff until now, that's totally fine. You know, do your best to track it going forward. If you have been tracking it, but you're not, you know, able to always write down every little thing that happens, that's totally fine as well. This is all just about doing your best so that when you do go back and talk to the school, you have something to point to to say, you know, this is how it's going. This is what they've been able to do. This is what they haven't been able to do. Because that's going to help you both to revise their own learning plan and get better services. I mean, for example, on Tuesday, all day, no schoolwork. Well, what's on Tuesdays? Is there direct instruction? Um, is it, you know, group learn? Is it independent? Is it something about that day in particular? Is it something about the assignments? But it gives you a baseline. You can start looking for patterns. Of, is it just the middle of the week? You know, maybe Mondays and Thursdays are better because they've come back from the weekend or they're getting ready for the weekend. But it, it helps you figure out what are the issues and how can we address them rather than just sort of scheduling a meeting and saying, I don't know, but Amanda just isn't making any progress. You know, she refuses to do her work all the time. We want to have as much data as possible because it will help revise the remote learning plan. And it helps when you request compensatory education later to have something to point to and some records to show why the services weren't sufficient or why they weren't getting what was in the IEP. Um, Melanie, how are we doing? Should we push through? Do we have any questions that we want to answer now? Or I know we're getting close to the end, so whatever you think. Yeah, I mean, one, there's one concern about students who have um, 504 plans or get extended time or other accommodations because now, you know, time is not really an issue because anyone can turn in assignments, but it's just, you know, this constant like, okay, it's taking us longer to get assignments done. We can always turn them in, but there's no, there's no break. There's no, you know, time off from doing work. It's, you know, school work all the time. And, um, you know, the parent had asked to break assignments up um, into smaller chunks, maybe, you know, that could be a good thing. I had suggested, well, maybe if it's, you know, some sort of like math worksheet, maybe you could reduce the number of problems so they don't have to do the full amount and talk with the school about other modifications to the work that could be done. Um, if it's just this, you know, never ending, you know, turnaround of, okay, we get extra time, everyone gets however long they want, but just we never, we never feel like we have caught up and are, you know, ready to go with um, the next assignment. So, I mean, I think, you know, maybe looking for some other, you know, solutions and talking with the school collaboratively and saying, okay, like, look, this is really draining and really difficult. Like, what other things can we, you know, discuss or work on? Um, but I think some of the things that you've discussed are good. I mean, it sounds like the school's maybe not being receptive, and I think that's a different issue as well. And I think, you know, we can ask for things and we can document it and we could say this is why it's appropriate. I mean, I don't if we're not going to get anywhere with them, I, I don't know what else we can do at this point in time. Um, you, know, I, you know, this is not, you know, satisfactory, but just do the best that you can. And, um, you know, you know, make sure, like we said at the beginning, like make sure that your family is coming first and that, you know, your mental health and your well-being are really focused on. Yeah, and you know, maybe something you do is ask the school if they're getting a math assignment that they would normally do during the school day, how long would you expect a student to spend working on this math assignment? And if they say 40 minutes, well, let's start with having your student try 40 minutes and see how many problems they get done. And then like Melanie said, 
maybe trying to reduce the number of problems or coming to an agreement where they spend a certain amount of time completing assignments for each subject. But you know, I can understand where, especially when you're working at home, if they're just giving you these packets and saying, get them done. And even if you have extra time, it's like, you know, the boat's sinking and you're trying to shovel out the water with the pail. It's just not going to get the job done and it's just going to keep adding up. So it, I wish there was a simple answer. And a lot of it is just pushing the school to see what they'll give you. Can we decrease the amount of problems? Can we set an amount of time that they're expected to work? And as long as they're doing that, you know, that will be considered completing the assignment, things like that um, could be helpful. So now we're going to talk a little bit about timelines for IEPs and evaluations. And this is just to sort of let you know there's a lot of confusion about school closures, remote learning, and um, how these different timelines are impacted. So first of all, remote learning days are school days. So these count just like a day where your student's in school. It's why you know we're really pushing to make sure they're getting these educational services during remote learning. Um, but it also means that these timelines still apply. Active God days, uh, which were March 17th to March 30th, do not count as school days, but um, you know those ended at the end of March. So since April 1st, we've been in remote learning and um, those have all counted as school days. Now, maybe your district has um, spring break or planning days or something specific. So I would check your district's calendar, but as an overarching rule since April 1st, we've been um, in remote learning and having school days. Uh, so just these timelines, if you ask for an IEP meeting, the school must answer in 10 calendar days. That's, you know, 10 calendar days. So 10 days from the day you request a meeting, um, school or not. Ask for an evaluation uh, or testing of your student. They must answer in 14 school days. So we're in remote learning right now. So it would be 14 remote learning days. Um, and then if they agree to the evaluation, they have to finish and hold the eligibility meeting within 60 school days. Uh, we should note there's an exception. Some assessments might be impossible to do remotely. And so ISBE has said that, um, you know, if an evaluation requires face-to-face -face meeting or observation in a classroom, that these can be um, delayed until the fall or until school resumes, whenever that is. Um, but I would talk to your school about any concerns and try to find ways around it because a lot of evaluations, although maybe they can't do everything remotely, they can probably do a lot of different evaluations that you can fill out questionnaires, rating scales, things like that, that they would usually use. So maybe even if they can't complete everything they want to do for evaluations, they can complete a majority of them and then you can still hold an eligibility meeting or an IEP meeting with the understanding that, you know, there are some evaluations that won't be completed until the fall. But if you want to have that meeting, I wouldn't, you know, accept the school just saying, oh, well, we can't do that during remote learning. I would push back and say, okay, well, what can we do? And can that give us enough to um, hold a meeting? Alternatively, if you're okay waiting until the fall, if you think your student services are fine and you don't need that reevaluation, then um, that's fine as well. But, uh, you know, don't just take the school at their word if they can or can't do it. And if they say we can't do a certain assessment, I would push back on that as well and say, well, what assessments can we do? Um, and what information can we get? Because I think, you know, if we're just pushing off all these evaluations, it's going to be harming all of our students um, in the fall because there's going to be a huge backlog of evaluations from March and then all the new ones that are due. So I would, I would try and push back. I wouldn't just accept, oh, we can't do it unless you don't think it will be good for your student. So I, I mean, I, I think use your best judgment on do you want to push forward with getting an evaluation? Because um, typically the law is if they can't get it done within the 60 school days before the end of the school year, they have to do it over the summer you know, maybe we're going to start opening up some things in the summer. I, you know, I just really don't know. So maybe that's something you want to say, well, if we can open up in the summer, can we get a summer spot um, to do the evaluation? Or can we, you know, do some testing remotely and, and see if that would work for your student? That might not work for every student. So maybe that's not something you want to push for.
So I thought the grades for fourth quarter were the incompletes, right? So they couldn't fail, Mary. Maybe, correct me if I'm misunderstanding, um, that they're getting grades, but they can't, if their grade goes down, so like for the semester, if they got a B first, first quarter or third quarter, and now they're getting a C, it will be a pass instead of um, like a C for the overall semester. But if it's, um, if they are failing, they can't fail, it will be considered an incomplete. Um, I think I think the grading That's is good. very complicated, but I, yeah. I, my understanding was that it, remote learning still cannot cause your students grades to go down. But I, I could be wrong because I know there's been a lot of discussion about that. You know, I think that that there is guidance on it, but I my kids have been told that their grades, you know, they're they're getting really they're putting everything in and um, it doesn't, they're treating it like a regular quarter, at least at their school, so. Yeah, that's surprising to me because my understanding was if their grade, you know, went down, then it would be considered a pass. It wouldn't have a letter grade. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is more for like middle school, high school yeah. students rather than the primary elementary school grades. Um, so, and then if, in, if they are failing, then they would not fail. They would get an incomplete and could make that up, um, essentially without having to pay any of the fees for making up that credit. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm behind in the chat, so give me a minute. Uh, while you catch up, Melanie, I'll talk a little bit about uh, compensatory education and uh, the possibility of getting extra help or services uh, to make up for missed services. Uh, as I mentioned, March 17th through the 30th were act of God days, so there is not compensatory education for services missed during those days. Uh, but each day after that is a school day, and so you should be able to get compensatory education for any services that your student has missed out on, been denied, unable to access, all of these things. Um, so, you know, one way to do that is to request an IEP meeting and try to have a discussion at the meeting about what services your student needs to make up for what they missed. Um, you know, this can be a little trickier in CPS. Uh, they get district representatives involved and things like that, but it's, it's a good starting point. And especially if you are developing a remote learning plan, like I said, these things a lot of times go hand in hand, right? So we're trying to figure out how to improve the services you're getting now and how to make up for um, the services that were missed in the past. So if your student doesn't have a remote learning plan, I would recommend you know, requesting an IEP meeting and saying, I want to talk about the, at the meeting about developing a remote learning plan to make sure that um, Amanda is getting the services in her IEP during remote learning. And I want to talk about the fact that she hasn't been getting those services since April 1st and what compensatory education, you know, we can figure out to make up for that. And that could be something over the summer, it could be specific tutoring, it could be, um, you know, extra services now outside, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I say now, I don't know, because we're having trouble just getting students the services they need in remote learning, let alone extra services to make up for missed services, um, which is why I think a lot of people are wondering, do we have to wait until school resumes to get comp ed? You don't have to. Um, you know, it, it kind of depends what you think is best for your student. If you can get a remote learning plan figured out now and you think okay you know this is tough enough to stick up and make progress to the remote learning plan uh you know you have two years to file a due process request one year for uh and state board of education and ISB state complaint so you don't have to do it right away um you can figure it out later but it's just whatever works for you, but you don't have to wait. You can ask them to start providing combat now. The district might just claim that they're a bit limited in what they can offer right now during remote learning. And the combat can be for academics, it can be for related 
services, right? Like we talked about, it can be speech, it can be extra PT, OT. Um, if a student has, you know, like our uh, Isabel, our example, who does Wilson reading, maybe they agree to provide private tutoring for her for a bit to make up for those missed services. It can really be whatever the student needs to make up for those missed services. Um, and so we're getting to the end here. Just a couple uh, suggestions of do's and don'ts. And then I think we have some closing thoughts and then we can hopefully respond to a few more questions. I know uh, they're coming in pretty quickly, Melanie. So hopefully you're keeping up. Um, do ask for an IEP meeting via phone or video conference to talk about a distance learning plan. That is so important. Um, I can't stress it enough. It gives us a baseline for what to expect in remote learning. It gives you a baseline for how to pursue compensatory education if the remote learning isn't sufficient. Um, and I would say do it even if, you know, you might be saying, oh, well, school's done in a couple of weeks or whatever. I, I would still ask for one because it, I would rather get it figured out now and who knows what we'll be doing in the fall. And if, you know, we get to the fall and we're still remote learning, it will be very helpful for you to already have a remote learning plan even if it needs to be adjusted for the new school year, it gives you something to work off of. Um, so I would strongly recommend doing that. Uh, schools should not be saying that they're not holding IEP meetings or they're unable to meet with you. Do it over phone, do it over video conference. I know it's not perfect, but um, you know, it's the best we have for now. And do, you know, this, we've been talking about this, you can agree to a distance learning plan without agreeing that the plan provides a faith. Um, don't sign any waivers, don't agree to change the IEP. Those are the two most important things. The remote learning plan is a separate document that discusses how they're going to deliver the IEP during remote learning. So you can do those. Uh, yeah, don't sign a waiver, like I said, and don't, oh, I actually just covered those and don't agree to take away any services in the IEP. Uh, and then just a couple points to remember, try your hardest to keep track of how your child is doing on his or her schoolwork. That is so important. I know it probably seems like um, a lot of work, so just do your best, but as much as you can, that will be really helpful for negotiating um, or advocating for additional services, both now and in the future. Um, talk or if possible, email. Uh, everything in writing is always our best practice. Um, but talk to your child's teacher if your child is having trouble, right? We want to make sure the school's aware of these issues um, because they shouldn't be satisfied with just saying, here's a remote learning plan, you know, figure it out if that doesn't work. Hey, you know what? If your student is able to log on and do their work, that's great. Um, you have an incredible child, I would say, because we're not seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot more of students having issues. It might not be every day. Um, it might not be every subject, but whatever issues they are having, you know, make sure you're in communication with the teachers in the school to make sure that they're aware that you're having issues and trying to figure out how to revise the remote learning plan. And finally, uh, don't be too hard on yourself. It, this is a really difficult time. Uh, parents are juggling a lot, um, you know, work from home, figuring out how to keep their families safe. Uh, educating students it's there's a lot going on and so this is just one aspect of it do your best um, communicate with the school track stuff but you know it's not going to be perfect and it, it, it's unfortunate but it's not going to be the same as when the students are in school every day so we're all here just trying to figure out how to make the best of a bad situation and um, you know, if we need to try to get comp ed later, we can do that and we'll figure it out. And so um, if you have questions, call us, uh, Equip for Equality, we can help. I'm sure raise your hand obviously has resources and can help as well. Um, but this, this shouldn't all feel like it's falling on you. And I know for a lot of parents, it really, it really is because you're the one who's there every day, right? You're the one seeing your student struggle, unable to access um, their material. So. Uh, it shouldn't all fall on you, and please um, take advantage of your resources like Equip for Equality and raise your hand. So while there were some um, conversations about requesting ESY services and what data will be used, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I think 
you know, parents are pretty concerned because their students are falling further and further behind and they want to use that extra time to, you know, help support them. I mean, I think if you have data from the winter break, I think that will be the clearest to show CPS like, hey, my student regressed over this two week break. If you have data over, you know, the act of God days, if you have, you know, data from third quarter and now in fourth quarter with the remote learning, you have like clear, you know, my student was able to do X, Y, Z and their IEP goal and benchmark and now we're, you know, set back significantly. Um, you know, I think we could show that, you, you could show that data. If you're collecting data, I think you can present that and show that they need ESY services. Um, I don't know what CPS's ESY is gonna look like. Um, because I would say typically, you know, if, if they're getting inundated with requests from ESY, I think they're going to have to be, you know, providing a lot more support over the summer. And I, ha I don't know, Will, have you seen anything about ESY? I don't feel like that's something that we've seen anything about. I haven't seen anything specific, no. Um, yeah, I understand I, that it will be remote learning, but I'm just, you know, because typically when I see ESY over the summer, it's, um, you know, for more so for cluster program students than for mm. other students. So I think um, if I misspoke, Bridget, that that was what I meant that, um, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of regression during this time away from a, a typical structure and school and school day and, um, you know, making the qualifications um, to to qualify for for ESY might be much more clear now. Um, so I think, um, you know, there's some more, more questions here. Oh, they've opened the application attempting right. to hear additional teachers. Okay, great. You, you're in the know. You're in the know, Bridget. I was uh, just going to add for ESY. Um, so it's a little complicated, right? Because as Melanie was saying, ESY is generally designed for students who would regress so much over the summer that they fall behind when school resumes in the fall, right? That is a little different than students who are regressing now because they're not getting education. I guess they kind of go hand in hand, right? Because if a student isn't getting remote learning for a month and a half or two months and they start to fall behind, that supports the idea that they would need ESY. But um, that doesn't necessarily, like, I guess that also might just support an argument for comp ed and summer school or extended school year could be a form of comp ed, but you could also pursue something else. So I guess um, it would kind of depend on the specific student, whether ESY is appropriate just generally based on the student's needs, or if we're saying they just need it in this situation because they haven't been getting an education the last couple months which would be more of a compensatory education request than just like a standard, um, my student needs ESY, if that makes sense. I, that might just overcomplicate. That makes sense. Yeah, Melanie, you wanna? Great. Um, we have, I don't know, Mary, if you had other items on your agenda, I know there's only a few minutes left in the raise your hand meeting. We're happy I to- have some, I have some, very general things that I mentioned at the beginning. So if people have questions, I really would like you to answer them because um, we don't have, well, I know you're on the calls a lot, but I just think this is a great opportunity to get some, some insight from very knowledgeable people. So do any parents have any questions? If you, if you wanna open it up to Talking, we could do that too. If it don't be faster. Let's see. Chris Palmieri says, how can we respond to when a school says they cannot provide SEL goals? Social skills. I mean, I think I if mean, the school is saying blanket, we can't do it. I, I mean, I think that's bad for like, that's a, a red flag. They should definitely not be saying that. Say, okay, well, what can we do for a social skills group? I mean, I think you could set up a social skills group remotely and work on, you know, some skill. It's not going to be perfect, but I think you could definitely discuss, okay, let's get a small group together and, um, you know, work with the families and the social worker and, and get something going. So, 
I mean, what can you do if they just deny it outright? I mean, you can document it and request compensatory education later is basically kind of our strategy, what we're saying now. Um, it's not satisfying, but I mean, we can't force them to create a program uh, other than complaining about it and then in the future um, requesting it. And I would recommend um, if the school is just blanket saying we can't provide this or they're offering something that is clearly not, um, you know, going to meet the needs of the student. You can also, if, if you think it would be helpful, just be candid with the school and be like, okay, well, I'm documenting this and I am planning to pursue compensatory education because, you know, my child is entitled to these services and sometimes just letting them know that you are tracking it and you're coming back for that comp ed later is enough to let uh to encourage the school maybe to find a more uh creative way to meet those needs during remote learning okay uh gabriella says i work from home and my first grader barely started getting minutes with direct instruction this week after I watched your other presentation, is it because ISBE just passed guidance? The school appeared a little clueless. Um, it, it could be that ISBE passed um, updated guidance. It could also just be that schools are, you know, figuring this stuff out as well. And so, um, you know, Gabriella, your students, uh, school might have just been slow figuring out um, how to provide direct instruction um, or how to deliver these minutes. That's not to excuse the schools. They, they have a duty to provide what's in the IEP, um, but I, that's why, you know, as much as possible, we want to encourage parents to be proactive in contacting the school and saying, how are you going to provide this um, and sort of put them to task to make sure they're figuring it out because um, it's, it's, they might not know how to do it, but you want to work with them to get those services and then, um, you know, for whatever they missed, again, combat, combat, combat. Right. Yeah, so Gabrielle is asking, can I start the conversation about compensatory services? So, yeah, you can start that conversation at any time. Um, one thing that we had talked about potentially strategically is waiting to see if we are going to continue with remote learning in the fall or not because you know if you you know the strategy with cps is go high and then settle for something less <laughs> i would say so if you are requesting it now we don't even know how long remote remote learning is going to continue so we don't want to like cut off any of your bargaining chips early um and i'm sure um you know like you, you could say like, okay, I disagree with these services and I'm going to be requesting compensatory education and having that documented in the IEP to like clearly say you, you are dissatisfied and that you want compensatory education services. Um, I don't think we have any plans that from CPS on any type of structured compensatory education um, plan. And we know with the, the, what is your thing called, Will? SSCA, I can't remember what it stands for right now. Student yeah. Corrective Action. Student Specific Corrective Action. Yeah, yeah, Student Specific, that's what it was. Like the, the comp ed for that has taken two years um, to get something structured. So, I mean, I wouldn't bank on anything like that from CPS. Um, so it might take filing a formal request for mediation. And I think you'd wanna go in there with as much ammunition as you can to get the best outcomes. And, you know, if you want, you know, social skills support, you know, go to Advocate Illinois Masonic and see if they have a social skills group that you can get on the wait list for or like different, different resources. And then you can come back to CPS and say, okay, like, I want you to pay for, you know, X, Y, Z that outside of school, you know, if that's something you can access or, you know, um, you know, Tutors of America or Wilson certified tutors or, you know, different structures like that, if that's something that you think is what your child will need. And if you can say, look at like, they got nothing during this time. And, um, you know, speech, speech pathology, speech services, if you have um, outside speech services, as much outside support as you can start prepping right now, I think that will give you, you know, better outcomes in the future. That's great. Um, 
we're we're at two thirty. Can you stay on a few more minutes to answer a couple more questions? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I have a private one here that want someone who wants to remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, my son, uh, child, has a shared para support, and we have struggled with completing even minimal work. He has social work minutes, but no academic support. I'm having trouble supporting my child properly with all of the attention he needs. How do I get the help he needs? Can a para and teacher have virtual support with him? I mean, yeah, the para and the teacher can have virtual support. I think, you know, as much as you can figure out what you want from the school, if you can say, okay, I want to schedule, you know, a 30 minute video, you know, Google Classroom, or Google Meet or, you know, whatever the platform is. Yeah, Google Meet for CPS um, and have the, them go through it. And like, um, you know, I, I, would, I would just be as specific with your request as possible and say, you know, we've been doing this for six weeks, we're not getting anywhere. Can we make some adjustments? This is what I think would help. Can we try this for two weeks, you know, and see, mm -hmm. see where you can go. Um, you know, maybe you'd want to talk about doing it in a small group setting. Um, if, you know, they don't want to do two, two teachers on one or, you know, I, I don't know what that might look like, but I, I would, I would come up with something that you want to ask for and say, can we try this and see what they say. Um, you know, not having the academic support, I think, is 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 tough. Um, I don't know, Will, do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, well, I think, and I mean, we haven't seen yet how much success parents have with this, but it, the, the remote learning plan should provide an opportunity to get extra services if that's what the student needs during remote learning, right? So if this student has a shared para in school, and that's probably enough, right? Because if there's a para in the classroom who can check in with the student somewhat consistently, make sure they're doing their work, um, maybe that's good enough. But, you know, maybe that's not enough on remote learning to have a shared para during their, you know, minimal instruction. So maybe going back to the school and saying we need direct minutes, um, during remote learning, or we need to find another way to structure these assignments to make them more accessible. Um, you know, I, it kind of is, remains to be seen what exactly you can get, but, you know, it shouldn't always be how is a remote learning plan going to be to decrease these services, right? right. And some students, they might need more services under a remote learning plan. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, you know, contact the school. And like Melanie said, if you have a specific ask, you know, maybe your student needs a 15 minute check in in the morning and the afternoon. I don't know if that's realistic, but if they have a para who could do that just to say, you know, where are you on your work? How are you doing on this? How are you doing on that? Um, go to the school and specifically ask for that. Worst case scenario, they say no. And now at least we have a, a record that you asked for something and the school denied it. Um, or work with them and say, okay, well, if you can't give me that, what can you give me? Uh, but that's really the remote learning plan. I, I don't want people to think about it as limited to basically, how are we going to provide less than what's in the IEP? It's how can we take this really difficult situation and make it work for my specific student? Okay, um, we've got uh, two more or three more. Uh, well, I'll go to the next one. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, can we confirm ODLSS FAQ 3.0 state staff may work one on one with student as long as parent guardian is in the room? My interpretation is that this should include SPED teacher and SICA. I am, am I correct in saying that there's no policy slash privacy barrier currently in place to impede on direct instruction or para support one-to-one -one with a parent in the room, provided staff is available? Um, I, so I don't think so, but I, I think it was this from uh, Christine, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, CPS is, uh, I, in my opinion, been kind of intentionally vague with these things, right? So mm -hmm. um, that would be something for your student. If the school is saying they can't do that, I would go back and say, well, this is what the FAQ says. Um, so, you know, I disagree with that. And I think that sort of ties into an earlier question that may be stated or alluded to the idea that the school was kind of clueless about this stuff. The teachers and the administrators, there's a lot of confusion, right? We have ISB guidance, we have 
CPS, you have ODLSS, we have all this different guidance, you have district representatives saying one thing, principals saying another. So, you know, I'm not sure, maybe in some cases schools are clueless, maybe sometimes they're confused, maybe sometimes they're bad actors, I don't know. But I think a lot of times there's just confusion about what they should be providing or what they're supposed to be providing. So, you know, I would go to them and say, I think you should be providing this is, you know, is there some reason you're telling me that you can't? And if then they point to the FAQ, then maybe it's time to have um, a larger conversation with the district and uh, I guess their attorneys who I'm sure crafted this language to figure out what the heck they're exactly talking about. Okay, so the last one, my daughter does not have a remote learning plan. Can I request one now? And how many days does the school have to set one up? I mean, you can definitely request one now. I don't think there is any guidance on how many days. Um, I think from Dr. Jones a couple weeks ago, she said that CPS had opened remote learning plans for mm -hmm. several thousand that's students. Mm -hmm. 1,000. Okay, 1,000 students. So I think you could go and request it and, and, you know, try and get it like as soon as possible and say, you know, I don't need, maybe I don't need the whole IEP team to meet if, if that is something that you would agree to. I mean, I, I don't know what you would want because if the whole IEP team has to meet to discuss it, then it, it will follow those IEP timelines, which are much more, you know, slow than, you know, we have no guidance on what a remote learning plan timeline is. Um, so you could potentially get that faster or you could maybe even say like this is what I'd like my remote learning plan to look like you know can we figure out something close to this and you know try and try and figure something out that way I, I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't present a remote learning plan to CPS and, yeah. and see how they go yeah <laughs> that's a great idea um, okay everyone we're, we're over time, so I'm not even going to do our introductions like we usually do. Um, next week, the ISBE monitors are going to be on the call the first half hour. So please join us then. And also, uh, Jenny posted a link to a survey about this call, about this experience, if you get a chance. And also, uh, Raise Your Hand is still doing the parent survey 